Okay, everybody. It is 6.30 p.m. on November 18th, 2020. And I hereby call the meeting of the Story County Board of Supervisors to order. This is a special meeting uh, to review a proposed revision of the septic ordinance in Story County. Notice of the meeting was printed in the Tribune on November 12th and is also posted on the county's website. The text of the proposed ordinance is also on the website itself. And if you want to look at it, if you're watching from home, or doing, um, click on the government heading and then under environmental health in the middle and there's a link to the document on the top of the green box on the left side of the page. And the proposed ordinance is also attached to the agenda for this meeting, which is on the agenda center, on the ways there's meetings and agendas um, on our homepage. Our meeting is originating from the public meeting room at the Story County Administration Building in Nevada. We're providing public access using Zoom because an in-person meeting is impossible due to the social distancing requirements we're observing to help slow the spread of the COVID-19 um, virus. And with the governor's latest proclamation, there are even more um, restrictions than we had been doing previously. So first, I would like to entertain a motion for adoption of the agenda, which was posted on the Story County website. So moved. Second. Discussion? If not, Olson? Aye. Pedans? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Agenda's adopted. Um, just for everybody's knowledge and information, before we go any further, I'm going to give a brief history of the proposed ordinance. Work on it began in 2019. The Story County Board of Health approved the proposed ordinance and advanced it to the supervisors for their consideration on February 4th, 2020, and with a few revisions again on August 4th, 2020. The supervisors had intended to hold a public hearing on it shortly after the February 4th um, when we first received it. However, unfortunately, COVID-19 intervened in that plan as it did in so many of our plans. We closed our administrative building where the supervisors meet uh, to the public on March 27th and did not reopen it until October 5th. And as we talked along, uh, through that time we talked about this, we um, decided we were going to postpone holding a public hearing on the ordinance because we'd hoped to have a meeting where everybody who wanted to could attend in person. However, due to the social distancing requirements, uh, we limited our, our public meeting room capacity and just wasn't possible. We even looked at using Gates Hall, but the audio system there doesn't easily allow for recording and broadcasting an event. And then in addition, the recent surge of the COVID-19 pandemic doesn't even make that advisable. Because it's been so long since the ordinance was sent to us and because we do not know when we again can have large meetings safely, we decided to go ahead with the public hearing via Zoom. We have held other public hearings, most notably one on a CAFO application via Zoom. We've also encouraged people to comment on the proposed ordinance via our website and we've reviewed all the input received on that also through emails that we got separately and also telephone calls. I will summarize later in the meeting the public input that we received. I would also note this is the first consideration of the proposed ordinance. So there will be two other uh, opportunities for people to speak on at least one more on the second consideration and on the third consideration unless waived. Um, we had kind of been holding out hope to have an in-person meeting, but the numbers don't seem to be, be giving us the opportunities to do that. We need to look at what's the best in the best overall interest of the public. Um, Leanne, I'm going to ask if you can display the agenda so I can explain our process for the meeting, just in case there's somebody out there that can't, doesn't have it in front of them. And we're hearing that it's kind of soft, so you guys are going to speak pretty loud. Speak okay. louder. Okay. Okay, so this is... Okay. Okay. First thing is going to be, uh, after, after I finish explaining this, um, that... Margaret Janes, our director of the Story County Environmental Health Department, uh, is present on the Zoom call and she will lead us through a presentation regarding the proposed ordinance. Her presentation will be displayed on the screen 
It is also available as a link on the agenda on our website and on the environmental health page of the website. After her presentation, the supervisors will have an opportunity to ask questions of, of Ms. James. Then we will consider and allow public comment as follows. First, what I will do is I will summarize the number and, the, and, the, and just summarize what we did receive via public comment. All the supervisors have received a file containing all of those comments. We will also forward this file to the DNR. After I have acknowledged all the comments received, no, that's not, excuse me, we're not forward this to the DNR. That was for another point here, never mind. After I've acknowledged all the comments received, I'll call on members of the public who indicate their desire to speak during the public comment session. And when I do that, before we open up for comments, I'll give instructions on how to use Zoom or if you're calling in from a phone. Then after everyone has had an opportunity to speak, the supervisors will discuss and consider the proposed ordinance. So other supervisors, presenters, have I missed anything? I don't think so. Okay. And what I will do is turn this over to Margaret James to give a presentation on the proposed ordinance. Margaret? Good evening. Margaret, you may be muted. That better? <laughs> there, yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, is my are my slides advancing? You're in the title slide now. Okay. How did the second one come up? Yes. Hello. Yes. Okay. So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to present our proposed septic ordinance. Uh, we've been working on this for a long time. Started off, oh, several years ago. And um, several years ago, and we had our stakeholders meeting just about a little over a year ago now. Um, why are we taking a look at this, the uh, septic requirements at this point? Well, Story County is taking a proactive approach to improving water quality. The design, installation, and maintenance of a septic system have direct impacts on water quality. These proposals are part of the county's clean water initiative. Linda already went over the timeline, uh, but I just wanted to emphasize that the Board of Health did recommend uh, twice now this year to the Board of Supervisors to consider adopting the changes to Chapter 65 private sewage disposal systems. So that board has gone over it in quite a bit also and um, would like to see this carry forward through the Board of Supervisors. The proposed regulations, if passed by the Board of Supervisors, will replace the existing regulations. And that's why the, the first part of this is all stricken out, and mainly because it was just too impossible to move everything around and have continuity. So we struck it all and started new. So a lot of that material is still the same, but with a little bit of tweaking and um, cleanup. The effective date will be January 1st, 2021. Uh, this was inadvertently shown as uh, 2020. That year just apparently does not want to go away, um, but it's been corrected in the posted version now. So Iowa Administrative Code Chapter 69 sets minimum standards for septic systems in Iowa for the, county, for the counties to enforce. All counties have to uh, enforce a minimum. This, this is the minimum standard of uh, septic regulations. Counties have home rule and can enforce more stringent laws for septic systems with the exception of the time of transfer inspection requirements. So along with chapter 69, this set of regulations combines with those to make Story County's unique set of regulations. Story County began permitting systems in 1972. The bulk of the regulations were adopted in 1990. And then the biggest change since then uh, was in 2015 um, when it required uh, septic contractors be certified. 
So taking a look at the map uh, here, each of these green triangles represent a permitted septic system. We have 3,120 active permitted septic systems. We have an estimated 900 properties or a little over 20% of rural properties that do not have a septic permit. The time of transfer inspection program has found that most older houses that did not have a septic permit did not have a secondary system. They only had a tank and no laterals. A small study of about 10 houses when we were doing the uh, water quality improvement project near Hickory Grove Lake found that 100% of the houses that did not have a septic permit did not have secondary treatment for the sewage. Again, only a tank for those houses. This suggests that there are about 900 houses with no secondary treatment and the septic tank discharges directly to a field tile, a ditch, or a creek. Now this is a busy slide, I will go through them. This is the list of the major, the main requirements, uh, the main changes in requirements for the septic regulations. Um, I'll slog through these and then ones that are a little more complicated, I have additional screens to explain what's going on. So the proposed changes adds definitions, it sets more stringent setbacks to um, septics and wells to water bodies, limits the shared septic systems, it identifies when a construction permit or alteration permit is needed. Currently, the alteration permit is the repair permit. And why we changed this is so that we could add a few more situations that would only require a repair permit and not the full uh, cost and um, extensive study of a construction permit. Uh, the proposed changes continues the sanitarian conducting the site evaluations except for subdivisions. So this is the same as what it used to be. When we had the stakeholders meeting, we proposed that an engineer or a professional uh, soil evaluator uh, conduct all the evaluations. And uh, the stakeholders really did not want to see that. Um, so we, we decided to um, go with their advice and, and stick with the way we were doing it. One thing that we added though is that it allows the sanitarian to request assistance coring at the owner's expense. This past year has been so darn dry that it was, it's just been really, really tough to do uh, evaluations. Uh, recently at a, a, a site evaluation uh, north of Ames, a gentleman uh, cored or did a whole bunch of post holes uh, for me so that I could probe from the bottom of that and that worked out really well. Uh, people are just really willing to pitch in on these things. Uh, let's see, it specifies information required in the site evaluation report, sets special considerations for septic systems for proposed subdivisions. It allows a sanitarian to request an engineer's plan. And this is those special, um, special instances like churches or weird restaurants, things like that, that are on septic systems that uh, are just a little bit outside our purview. Um, it continues to require installers to be certified. It requires soil protection, sets more stringent holding tank requirements, issues certificates of completion. This is something new and it's mostly uh, to help the realtors out. It tells them that yes, this work has been done and you and the sale can go through and everything is a-okay. It requires a septic tank pumping every five years for existing and new septic systems. This is a new requirement that we're proposing. It changes due dates for maintenance agreements, sets requirements for discharging systems, and sets the adoption date at January 1st, 2021. Now let's first take a look at the table, um, sort of increasing or making more stringent some of those setbacks. The ones that we are changing are um, highlighted, and um, it's mostly the ones that are like direct contact with uh, water. So the edge of a drainage ditch, um, we uh, subsurface drainage tiles, we increase these a little bit. And then there's always a variance available if um, you know your lot is right on the property and things just 
just won't quite fit into these, we will write a, a variance. And it's important to keep in mind that uh, existing systems, once, once they're in the ground today, and all the way up to the first of next year, um, do not have to meet these new setbacks. They're just fine. They're basically grandfathered in. Receptic systems, lot size and configuration shall take into account features that impact septic system placement. And that's things like um, drainage ways, things like that, um, uh, special uh, protected features, uh, plants, things like that. Um, the lot lines have to be drawn with all of those things in mind, and then also keeping in mind that uh, soil-based systems are preferred. The final plat shall show the location of the proposed septic system for each lot on contour, a realistic uh, display of where they could go. Soil coin is not required at this step uh, because things often change with house placement, house size uh, between this step and when the house is actually built. For any subdivision of three lots or more, a professional evaluator other than the sanitarian shall conduct site reviews site evaluations for each lot. That means coring for each lot and a recommendation of the type of site and, and um, where it goes. Sanitarium will conduct a site visit and confirm all evaluations. This will ensure program continuity and provide a second review of environmental factors. Uh, I'll just go over briefly how a septic system works and especially how a septic tank works. Uh, this picture on the left shows um, you know, a house that flows to a septic tank and from the septic tank it flows to the distribution box. Sometimes it flows to a pump instead if you need an elevation or pressurized system. And then it goes from there to the laterals. These laterals here, whether it's a mound, sand filter, just plain old laterals, that's considered the secondary part of the system. This is the tank that's primary and the laterals are secondary. When I talk about those systems not having permits, that means, well, it, it implies that the house has a tank. I've never seen a house without a septic tank, but I've seen lots of houses without a laterals or secondary system. On the right here is a picture of a septic tank. Uh, the, the water comes in from the house, wastewater comes in from the house, drops down, it takes a circuitous route, and that's intentional. You want um, like two days or of, um, of residence in the tank uh, before it leaves the tank. As you can imagine, as this fills up, little by little by little, it flattens out these little wigglies, and then things are starting to go straight across without any settling. So you're, you're taking uh, wastewater that has got a lot of solids still in it and heading straight out and it would overload your laterals, your laterals or your um, or go straight out into the creek or tile. Um, so for mandatory tank pumping every five years. So septic tanks provide the primary treatment where the so solids settle out. Excuse me. Tanks should be pumped when the sludge depth is about one third or more of the liquid depth. Pumping the septic tank saves the homeowner money in the long run because it protects the laterals from clogging and or the house from having backups of sewage. It's important to note that um, all, the, all the conferences, classes that we go to, EPA, et cetera, recommend that you not use tank additives that the bacteria from just using the system is plenty. And oftentimes that additive will actually um, put things in suspension and put solids out into your laterals. So uh, save that money toward pumping instead of buying the product on the grocery shelf. Now this proposal will not require systems in poor condition to be repaired. However, in some instances, it may lead to the owner realizing that their system is not working and opt to replace the system. Excuse me. Hmm. 
This is um, directly from an EPA website, um, Environmental Protection Agency, how to care for your septic system. It says the average household septic system should be inspected at least every three years by a septic service professional. Um, we went a little broader on that, five years instead of the three. Um, household septic tanks are typically pumped every three to five years. Again, reiterated by uh, DNR, Iowa Department of Natural Resources, to help ensure the proper maintenance and long-term functioning of the entire on-site septic system, the tank should be pumped out every three to five years given normal household water usage. Pumping the tank helps prevent sludge and scum from flowing out of the septic tank and into the secondary treatment system. This, in the long run, saves money. You're protecting that tank. I mean, you're protecting those laterals. This is a picture that I took uh, doing an inspection north of Ames. Um, it was went back when we, um, when the county was doing um, time of transfer inspections and the state law was not yet in place. The burden of proof was on us, so we would often uh, put dye in the system. And so this time the tank was open, so I put the dye in the tank and just a couple minutes later it shot straight out here and um, followed this creek and it is super close to the Skunk River, which I'm sure a lot of you have canoed in before. Um, really, really disgusting. Uh, so when the septic, septic systems malfunction, water quality definitely can be impacted by bacteria, nitrate, phosphorus, pharmaceuticals, and human pathogens. This is a cool slide that I borrowed from our friend uh, Sarah Hager up in uh, Minnesota. And um, it says when septic systems malfunction, human health can be impacted by exposure to human pathogens. Um, Clostridium, staph, rhinovirus, flu, pseudomonas, E. coli, and our newcomer, uh, coronavirus. This map uh, shows DNRs, DNR and EPA put out um, a list of impaired water bodies every couple years. This is a map of Story County. The red lines show those streams that ha are on the impaired uh, list. It's not a good list to be on. Um, you'll see that the South Skunk, South Skunk, and um, and then again the South Skunk. This this lag of it over by Cambridge. Hickory Grove Lake and Indian Creek all are impaired by E. coli. E. coli comes from uh, mammals, warm-bodied uh, warm -bodied animals, uh, humans, deer, hogs, cattle, you know, you name it. Um, geese were a big, you know, they're not mammals, but um, you know, all sorts of uh, animals can do it. So not just people. So if you have high E. coli, it's not necessarily people, but it could indeed be people. And we are working with the university now, um, um, pretty soon, COVID again has, has delayed things, but to use an optical brightener to determine if we're picking up on laundry discharges, which um, is indicative of a failing sewer system um, effluent getting into the waterways. So what does it cost to pump a tank these days? It ranges a lot from 260 to about $400. This was a, a mini, mini survey that we took from our, um, the, there's three um, pumpers that, that cover most of the area. We're kind of getting into four pumpers now. Um, so that's about five or $6 a month. And that's for a five year range. Um, probably if you didn't put, uh, additives into your tank that would that would have about equal that I would say. The main um, the main septic guys in our area is um, drain tech and um, rotor rooter and um, Earl sanitation. When you think about pumping your tank people are sometimes they're hard to 
convinced that pumping is a good idea. But it's really no different than changing your oil in your car. Um, you do that for maintenance so that your car doesn't break down. You pump your tank so that it doesn't ruin the rest of the system. It's maintenance. That's all it is, it's maintenance. It's necessary. Now where does all of the sludge go that's pumped out of the tanks? It's a, it's a huge quandary, I'll say. So um, most of it in Story County gets land applied. Some of it goes to Ames, uh, some of it goes down to Des Moines treatment plants. When they land apply, they have restrictions on slope, application rate, high water table, distance to streams, food crops, residence setbacks, well setbacks. They also are required to do vector control with septic injection incorporation or increase the pH to 12 so that it kills the pathogens. Um, all three of them use uh, the pH control rather than incorporation or injection. These red circles indicate where the land application sites are in Story County. This one here, <coughs> excuse me, is Drain Tech. These two, let's see, yeah, these two here are uh, Rotor Rooter. And then these two here are Earl's Sanitation. So it's a, it's a lot of impact on, on those areas. We inspect, um, we inspect this one, Boone inspects these two, and Hardin County inspects these two. And it's based on where the business address is located. I, I, we don't see, I don't know if you're using uh, like a, a pencil or something to show. Oh, a pointer? It is not showing here what you're referring to. Can you get your cursor on your screen? Okay. Does that I'm work? Are you, are you seeing that? Yes, it's really hard to see what it gets on the actual map. Okay. So okay. So the one, okay, so which screen? This, does that work? Or does this work? I have no idea what you're at right now. Go back to what you were doing. That this? Works. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so Drain Tech um, does the one, it's actually within the city of Ames Incorporated area. They just grew, the city just incorporated them. And then Drain Tech, so that's Drain Tech. Rotor Rooter does these two sites, and Earl Sanitation uses these two sites. This is like a little um, farmland here, and then up here is um, kind of along one of those uh, wind turbine roads. Thank you, Margaret. You're welcome, sorry about that. Um, okay, so, and then for implementing the pumping program, so currently the pumpers are required to keep records for five years and you know they're inspected for you know their trucks their land application techniques and then also their record keeping so we know that they are keeping the records that shows the address of the tank gallons of septage and how how the septage was disposed of so in other words land application or um taken to a municipal plant um we'll we'll also need to get uh, like a general condition of the systems statement, like good condition, bad condition. Not a lot of work, just, you know, checking boxes. Excuse me again. Um, so Matt Corey has developed a software program getting close to completion for tracking the information collected by the pumper. Eventually, um, the pumper will be able to uh, download it from cell phone or computers. Um, Story County Environmental Health tentatively plans to monitor those areas that are directly by streams and then areas of high density like um, older subdivisions. Um, there will be random checks of systems that do not have septic permits. So those 900 are going to be um, randomly chosen also to be to see where they're at on their pumping routine. This is a new program, so we will continue to try different approaches until we find a successful approach to enforcement. This map uh, shows um, 
the intensity of density of septic systems. So, um, and then the green, oops, the green over here, uh, it shows the septic buffer of a quarter mile. So for example, if we wanted to take a closer look at those uh, systems or those addresses, that are within a quarter mile of a creek, we would pick the purple inside the green, okay? And um, so that would be one approach uh, to doing it. Um, with all of the uh, subsurface tiles that we have, you do not necessarily need to be right on a creek or a river to impact waters pretty quickly. So this is an idea, but it, it's not as easy or as perfect as it looks because of those uh, subsurface drains that people might be hooked to. Uh, let's see, so <clears throat> another uh, regulation that I wanted to explain just a little better is the discharging systems. So when you do not have a soil-based system, that system is, to designed, is designed to treat and then discharge. And so there's two types of systems that discharge. First one requires an NPDES permit, number four, um, the, and those are the ones that discharge to water bodies, and they must meet certain parameters set by DNR. That's um, sampling twice a year. Now, systems that discharge but do not require an NPDES um, is the other classification. They do not need to test twice a year. They can go for years and years without testing. But if for some reason I think that there's a problem going on with that, I can request that they sample um, to, at their own expense and, um, and we'll see if they're in the same parameters that are required of the NPDES discharging systems. The parameters that are shown on the screen here E. coli, um, biological oxygen demand, and um, total suspended solids. And again, these are taken right from the NPDES permit. The class A1 and A3 waters have a lower standard for E. coli, and those are direct contact type of uh, waters where people like are swimming or diving in it. Uh, class two waters are fishing, uh, fishing, things like that. Um, and then the ground surface, that would be um, the second class of systems. Um, they are at the, at the less stringent level. Now, again, we try desperately to use soil systems, so we limit the amount of discharging systems in our county. Well, that, that does it for my presentation. These changes to the septic ordinance are to improve water quality and protect public health. Thank you so much for your time and interest. I know I presented a lot of information here, and if you have questions or comments, I would love to entertain them at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. First, we're gonna ask the supervisors if they have any questions for Margaret. I have some, Lisa, you have some? Yeah. I you go too. first this time, I know. Sure. Uh, Margaret, thank you for your presentation. Um, that's so I actually have quite a few, so I'll ask a few and then pass it on to my colleagues and stuff um, so that we can go back and So um, right from your presentation, um, you talked about the, um, about 900 properties that don't have a septic permit. Why did they not have a septic permit? Um, because they were built before, the house was built before 1972 and then um, they have never been inspected and never have, um, we've never received a complaint to investigate problems with them. Um, so just they've never had to update for one reason or another. Okay, so is this kind of setting up a separate standard for those 900 compared to the other 3,000 then? The way, um, yes and no. So existing, um, Permit or no permit or new systems will all have to get on a routine five-year pumping schedule. Um, the way we enforce it, we might look a little closer at those 900 because those are the ones that I am afraid might be um, 
directly hooked to tile drains or um, going directly to streams. And uh, this will not replace those systems, but at least it'll clean out the tank and it'll protect the water a little bit from really bad things going straight to the creek. In one instance, I even saw, you know, toilet paper going right out, right out. So, um, you know, so if we could stop, at least stop that, that would be great. Um, I believe in your presentation too, you said that it, um, can you speak up a little? Yes, certainly. That they would not need to um, replace the system. Um, you went out and did an ex in the inspection and have them pump. But if they might find there are other issues, but a homeowner wouldn't have to replace it. Is that correct? So the problem could, could continue on. Yes, the problem could continue on, yes. Um, this is quite, you know, I think it's a, a, a moment to educate people too. Um, I think seeing is believing, knowing that, yeah, there is a problem here, I need to fix this. A lot of people, because of the time of transfer law, is, is really understood and well known throughout the county now. Um, people, well, we're gonna sell in five years, let's just go ahead and take care of it now. So I think that, um, I think some of them will be replaced um, because of this, but they will not be required to be replaced unless it's an egregious thing that someone else reports. And then what are the penalties? So you, you know, you've got the ordinance that I should pump every five years. What are my penalties if I don't? Um, so let's see, I've been sanitarian since 2009. The way my approach is to you know, if you discover a problem, you just nag them, nag them, nag them until they take care of it. So right now, you know, there can be fines, but we attempt. So if I see a violation, I call or write a letter. If that doesn't work, um, a certified letter. If that doesn't work, then a notice of violation. And then, and then we can, um, we issue a citation. Normally, if it goes all the way to the court, what we ask is instead of paying a fine, you put that money toward um, improving the problem, fixing the problem. Okay, I'll let okay. one of my colleagues ask them. So there, can, so there can be fines, and um, you know, Ethan always helps us uh, set those up, Ethan, the Story County uh, Civil Attorney. Um, but, I've never collected fines. I always work with people and get the job done instead. Well, I guess I guess one last thing then based on that those fines. So is there something in writing as, yeah. to, as to what those fines are? Um it's just the the um the simple misdemeanor fines that the county uses and I can't come up with those numbers right now, but it's it's kind of a universal up to Ethan, can you help me out here? Um in this ordinance. Right, yeah. It doesn't it, reference anything yeah. in the ordinance. No, it it, it. It's not necessary to reference it in the ordinance. Our um, Story County Court Ordinances 3.02 says that any violation of these ordinances may be punishable as a simple misdemeanor with a minimum fine of $65. Okay. So Thank you. any ordinance in the Story County Court of Ordinances is punishable under that rubric under 3.02. Thank you, Ethan. Great. And you said it's up there. Thank you, Ethan. $65? No. That's so start. It, starts, it starts there, and it can be more, and it can be up to a certain dollar amount every single day the violation persists. Okay. Um, my experience is reflected what Margaret said. We seek voluntary compliance. We've never been out to extract money in fines or penalties. We just seek compliance with the code of ordinances. And usually by the time we wind up in a court situation, Margaret or the appropriate enforcement officer has gone through multiple letters, multiple emails, multiple phone calls, and sometimes year or more worth of time in between. So it's a, it's a rare thing that we wind up in court. 
If it does, it's just sometimes to get that extra level of attention to the issue. Thank you. Thanks. Good. So Lisa asked a couple of my questions or came at a at them. So I'm going to go back to I remember when these discussions started back before 2019 when you started working on it, but there was great concern about the septic, some of the septic systems. What is in front of us today is not what I expected because it's pretty watered down and excuse that little pun there, okay, if you will. We were talking about making, at one time there was discussion about uh, whether we should go ahead and make those, if you will, 900 systems that we suspect, go and add a secondary field, come up to what would be a modern standard. So this is very, very lukewarm, okay, compared to what I was hoping for and expected to see. Now, based upon what we've got in front of us, Margaret, then, I'd like to know more about how, in fact, just asking for pumping really helps the ground quality. Because you said it plugs the laterals, which is a backup situation usually into the homeowner's house, correct? Or is that the Oh, okay. mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the you showed us with the dye, the effluent coming out or whatever, the water with the dye, that's no secondary system. So for most people who would be pumping, required to pump every five years, but they've got a functional system, um, is it literally just by not pumping that a system can fail? That's what I hit. I want to make that connection about where we're really connecting and protecting groundwater or water. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for those that have laterals, if you don't pump, yes, it can fail. So you're protecting the environment that way, okay? For those 900-ish, uh, pumping is putting a Band-Aid on the problem. It is buying us time until those guys, those women, whoever, will um, will put a secondary system in, well, an entirely new system in is what they would have to do. And, um, but I just didn't feel like we could target those 900. So we took this approach as, instead. And this was in part from the advice received from the Board of Health. I don't think that they were willing to go that far with uh, these regulations. Okay, well, I thank you and thank you for being honest on it, but I'm very disappointed in what I see here today. And so the questions that we've received from the public, I, I mean, several have been this about what's the point or what, what are you really trying to protect or prevent, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I'm really struggling with this. Uh, with well, I, it does still help. I, I believe it does still help, but it, it is not ideal. I mean, you're right. Ideally, we would have those 900 um, up to code and then have everybody pump in their tank every five years um, just to prevent them from failing. Okay, thank you. And, and I might just add there, I did go through all the comments and I didn't see anybody making the distinction between a system with secondary and not. I don't know that it got that that um, technical in the comments. Mm -hmm. It maybe people didn't follow it when the discussions first started, but I mean they were they were occurring with presentations that Margaret was doing quarterly. Okay. You know when we got about well I had to go out on this. A complaint or this, okay. I, the, my next question has to do with time, the time of transfer, because a couple of people brought that up in their comments about, well, this is covered under time of title transfer. But I did find that on our own website, you could link on. There's all kinds of exceptions to time of title transfer, right? So that exactly, is yeah, you did your homework. So, so you could confirm, like, especially if you're talking about in-family transfers, transfers that might occur related to foreclosure or, or court decrees, divorce, all kinds of them are excluded from having to do this. 
So we could end up with a system or systems out there that actually change title but don't get inspected or don't get inspected, right? Correct, absolutely. Consanguinity and the foreclosures, bankruptcies, those are the those are the big hitters that are getting off the hook. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. I think that's it. You did a good job narrowing in my question. So let me go next to just a couple things. One of them then is a follow-up to what Supervisor Olson has said about the loopholes on the time of transfer. Um, that's really not a, something we can change locally. That's legislation, correct? Correct. Yep. We, no home rule on that. Okay. We can think, we can think about maybe talking with uh, State Association of Counties about that then. What, you know. We brought that said, up to DNR. We brought said, that up to DNR and they're very concerned about touching it at all because they're afraid that if you, they try to fix some of those things that um, the whole thing would be yanked, gone. That's too bad. Okay, let me ask another question then and then I'll, I'll turn it back to Supervisor Heddens. But, um, and I don't want to get too much into the comments because I said I would summarize them later, but one thing that I did see was some people who are saying not every system has to be um, cleaned out, say, every five years. Somebody maybe who lives alone, um, doesn't have garbage disposal, compost, you know, does whatever, you know, and is very, very, um, very good about water use. Um, so let me ask you this. What would it do you think it would cost for an owner just to get an assessment every few years to have somebody come out? I understand there's some kind of technology to determine whether or not a tank needs to be cleaned out. Is that right? Yeah, you can use like a sludge judge to, to measure and um, just kind of take a peek in there. And um, I would guess, and I don't know, but I, I would guess around 100 because just getting somebody out there, you know, the truck time and this and that. Um, and then also like if they had to dig, uh, find and dig up the tank, you know, as opposed to manhole, uh, or, um, risers going to the surface. Um, so a hundred, I would say would cover it. So maybe a hundred dollars to save somebody a $300 pump out or delay it. Yeah. So they might want to just do it, just pump it. Yeah. Yeah, you just, yeah, you have to do a cost benefit. On you know, you get somebody out there, you don't want to mess with it one year later or two years later, just you get the guy there, do it. Okay. Okay. That's, that's, that was the question I have right now. I'll turn it back over to could Supervisor Head. Could I follow up just sure. on, on sure. Supervisor Murphy's question about it? What, what are you talking about with an assessment? Is that just that the tank needs to be pumped or would it be an assessment of the entire system, like the lateral? Um, just, uh, just of the tank. Yeah. Just of the tank and pump tanks. Mm -hmm. If you went all the way with the other, then that's a time of transfer type inspection. And what would that cost? Um, uh, more like five or 600 because there's two, at least two things you're digging up. You're digging up the, the D box and Lots of times you're using a camera, you're jetting, and you're writing a report. So, thank you. Oh, and you're um, hydrologically loading them, so that that costs some too. Getting the water there, um, so there's there's more involved. So four or five hundred dollars. Back to supervisor Hedens then. Um, yeah. So Margaret, so I'm looking at the ordinance, the chapter sixty five. Um, and it talks about the sharing of, of septic systems being prohibited. It's under 65 09. I'm just wondering how many shared septic systems do we have in the county? Well, um, hmm. there's, not a, there's not a whole bunch. There's all of the irons ones, and that's what reared its ugly head. There's like all those duplexes up in that new subdivision, they're shared, and that's problematic. And then you have a lot of um, situations, usually farming situations, where there's two houses on one property and they share a system. And um, 
they're just really hard to maintain. So we're going to, we're trying to wean people off of that, but mainly just not let it go on anymore. Um, it, it's especially pro, um, problematic if you have uh, two people and it goes to sell. And uh, so who pays for the inspection, who pays for the pumping, you know, on and on and on. So um, it's, we're doing them a favor by not, by trying to prevent people from um, having two, two groups on one system. Mr. Now, President, that being said. Go ahead, I'm sure. Uh, that ahead. being said, if there's uh, subdivisions that are proposed and they're doing, you know, green areas and parks and things like that, similar possibly to maybe Perry Valley, although they have separate systems, um, it is possible for, um, we would entertain the idea of having several houses on one system. If you go over four houses per system, then it turns into DNR authority. It's it's out of our hands. Okay, were you going to say something? Again? I was just going to say, I think my recollection with the irons was because they were putting in infrastructure that they were imagining it was going to be annexed by the city of Ames very soon and it was kind of temporary because they also did put in all the all the the pipes that would be needed for people to 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 um, connect that, on that's to. what that's what I recommended they do they did not do that they said that they would be that that's not doable that they would all be ruined by the time they needed to be used after that I was told that that would be fine to do it that way but bottom line, they put those in. They did plumb them so that the sewer lines kind of come out toward the front of the house so that when the city of Ames um, goes to hook up, that, um, that they'd be pointed in the right direction. But those pipes are not there, I'm positive. And um, I, didn't I, I believe it's written in, though, that, that the city taxes will not pay for that. Sorry. Okay, sorry. No, that's okay. So that just kind of continues with my question in that particular area. So I know that you're wanting to prohibit those shared shared septic systems. I understand there's a few exceptions. Um, it does state under that 6509 number two that for those shared systems not located in sub subdivision, efforts shall be made to change them over to individual systems. What's the time frame? What's the time frame What's to the do that? the time frame to go from a um, shared system because it's i didn't see it that, stated that's a good point i i guess i don't have one on there um yeah yeah because um soon it is has lots of definitions um i i could add the i, I could add a time frame or if you have a suggestion for a time frame that would be helpful um, well, that could be part of our discussions or whatever. I just noticed that I didn't see anywhere. I just noticed that I didn't have anywhere that it talked about a time frame. Let's just make a note of it for yeah. now. Right. Get back to it. I okay. Make, yeah. Thank you. Good Another idea. Another question is, um, should this move forward? You've got it effective January 1. Does that mean that all systems come January 1, that all systems you know, if they weren't pumped like last year or two years ago, that boom, they need to start pumping and how quickly do they need to be moving to have that get pumped? I know winter is not the best time to be pumping septic systems. Um, what would be that time frame? We would start looking at them we, um, probably spring because, uh, but then sometimes spring is too wet to get a pump tank in. Um, but at least going out with letters maybe in February to those that probably need them, most probably those, uh, some of those 900 folks uh, get those squared away. Um, and then if you, if you installed a, a new system, you would not need to pump it until five years after the date that it was installed. So we, we wouldn't be focusing on the newer ones. But what about those people who, the 3,100 of the permitted ones that aren't, that, that may be 10 years old? I mean, do, do they have to get this done in 2021 
so that they have a certificate to hand to you in, in January of 2022? Yes, if they hadn't pumped it in the last five years, they do need to pump it in 2021, um, although the chances are probably not as good as those 1970s houses uh, for being looked at. I mean, we just don't have the staff to look at everybody, so we will be first looking at the ones with no permits or the early, early permits, the 1970s. Okay, so then I'm going to go back to the ones with the no permits. So what type of education has gone out to those individuals about pumping or upgrading their system, any of that? I have a thought here. If we don't have a permit, they don't know where all of them are. They have some good educated guesses, but they you don't have a list of every place that does not have a permit but has a septic tank, do you? Well, um, I would bet that Matt could come up with a good match because, um, you know, it's, it's those address points on Beacon. And then you match them up to see if there's anything on file for septic permits. And if, and if it's an address without a permit, bam, you know. And sometimes we'll be, we'll be tricked because it'll actually be a barn with no running water or something like that but they still have an, ad an address. Um, but we'll catch a, most of them, yeah. So it goes back to my question. So what type of outreach has been done to those 900 them? Um, That's the bigger problem that yeah. they're not permitted. What, are, what have we done to target those 900? Targeting, we have not. So that I'd would like be to, a good way yeah. to start. Tar Okay, thank you. So I'd like to ask then about saying you don't have the staff to do everybody in 2021. How, I'm not sure that's fair. If we, if we tell everybody they got to pump every five years, and if they haven't pumped, if they can't prove they've pumped already in the last four years, right? They've got to, they, you know, they, they need to meet this. But then you're saying that you're not going to target some groups right away. I mean, I, I, I'm i not comfortable with, you know, how I'm about the fairness thing. It, it doesn't sound yeah. fair to, to um, kind of pick and choose of that among the 3,100, you know, permit people who got who has to and who hasn't and how old are they or whatever so i'm not comfortable with the execution not that that can't be fixed but you know asking about the 900 is one thing though that's where the problem is right but the 3100 i think there needs to be a fair more systemic plan here to make sure that everybody is in fact expected and we can document who hasn't met the law and who has in that first year. Otherwise, some people are just getting a pass, you know? And yeah, I guess I'm just going for the biggest bang for the buck, to be honest. Um, but I see your point. Um, you know, we could just do random and hope, hope that a good portion of them go to the ones more in need but yeah, we could just do random for all addresses uh, in in a rural in rural county. Mm -hmm. When you say random, to me that means some do, some don't. Let's right. go back to you could send a letter out to every single address that you have show has a permitted tank, uh, septic system. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the same thing. I don't thing, know if right? my budget would support that at this point, but I could so look into it. Coming back to the to ask for money, but so that's what you're afraid of is a budgeting thing rather than anything. Else. How many yes, yes. staff do you have available to do this, Margaret? Well, um, I have two and a half, um, two and a half full time. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, lots of other programs going on, but right now with COVID, I think there's this is a perfect opportunity for uh, getting letters out. What I'm saying, what I'm kind of getting at is there's two and a half full-time staff in environmental health, and this is only one of their many duties. So
So I would not anticipate that you could with any confidence put all of the things you're being asked right now into an ordinance because once you put them in an ordinance, they're the law. So I'm personally comfortable understanding that and knowing that you're going to have to do a plan of how you implement and that you're probably going to find out as you go along, you're going to have to revise that plan. And I think that's where policies and plans come into to play as opposed to putting everything in an ordinance when there's a lot of unknowns, when you don't know if it's going to be a cold winter, you don't know if it's going to be a wet spring, you don't know if you're going to have staff out sick. I, I just, I can understand why you need to write a plan, a strategic plan to, to implement this that's separate from the ordinance itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, go, go ahead. I just. No, you're fine. I know I had a couple other questions, but um, I'm just trying to figure out where I am on my list here. You know, I, I'm also fine listening to the public comment and then through our discussion, mm -hmm. it may come up and may have some additional questions for Margaret at that time. We could go on and do it that way. Should we do that? Should we go yeah. to the yeah, public comments? Good. Okay. Let me, let me um, do the summary first of what we did receive. And what I tallied were the, the, what we got from our website, some emails, which was seven comments. In addition, I had three separate emails, which I think the other supervisors also received. I had one phone call and one text message, which was 12. Um, of those, and I tried to look at addresses as, as much as I could tell to see where they came from from around the county. Five were from Ames, and I, I think they were probably subdivision or rural Ames addresses. Three, Nevada, again, probably rural. One, rural Story City. One, that's rural south of between Ames and Huxley, I believe. One, around, around the Cambridge area, and one did not give an address at all. And I just went through, and I'm, I'm not going to read them all. I'm just going to uh, give you what I, what I saw as what the comments were. One was added expense to those with septic systems. That was repeated more than once. Uh, not always needed every five years. Pump out. That was more than once. Uh, somebody said they thought the time of transfer inspection was sufficient. A concern that systems can freeze if pumped out in the winter. Um, a concern that adding a bedroom can all of a sudden give you a requirement of having to put in a larger system. Uh, somebody has commented uh, the county shouldn't be telling homeowners to know how to maintain their personal property. Um, somebody called me, contended that a septic system that's working okay does not need to be pumped out. A concern about extra cost in selling a home if you have to upgrade the system at that time of transfer. Um, somebody contended that not very much, not a large percentage of the water pollution we have is caused by septic system malfunctions. And then there was a comment from two people about systems that, um, and they're usually newer systems and subdivisions that require an annual service contract. One uh, person said that he had a service contract annually that was over $300 that required an annual inspection and said, if, if I have a service contract that's costing me $300, $300 annually and somebody to inspect it annually and the inspector says, um, that I don't need to be pumped out and it's over five years, could that substitute for being a requirement of being pumped out? And I got a second text from somebody with an annual maintenance contract and asked the same thing. What they were both saying was basically they're getting their, their, their systems, and I think it's the Advantix system was what one gentleman said he had. They're getting those because they have to, when they install them, they have to do a maintenance contract. That's part of the installation. And they're paying over three hundred dollars a year. Well, good heavens! Cost me under three hundred dollars every five years to get my tank pumped out. So they're getting they're spending quite a bit. But he's saying if I'm already doing that, and they say doesn't need to be pumped out, can that substitute for me pumping out every five years? I think it's 
doesn't it say it in the ordinance? I thought that's what I'm the ordinance sure. addressed. I'm not Maintenance sure that it did. Contracts. Okay. Did it, Margaret? Was I? Did I miss it? Okay. That's right. Those maintenance contracts, though, usually do not cover pumping. The con the maintenance contractor will recommend pumping, so it's 300, 300, 300, and then splash in the, the pumping charge every three to five years. So what is covered? Yeah, under it's an expensive. So I just was kind of wondering, do you know what's covered under that maintenance contract then? If it's not pumping, it's... Do they have to change oh, valves? Well, yeah, like, um, you know, if they have sleeves, or like for the multi-flow comment, they have to come in, remove those sleeves, clean them out, replace them. Um, like for the cocoa filters, they have to go in and rake them, that kind of thing. So there's maintenance. It's most, a lot of it is eyes on the system, making sure the tipping plate is good, this and that. You know, there's just a lot of little things that work because there's a lot of moving parts um, that need to be checked. Okay. Well, that was the summary of the comments. Did either of the supervisors have any follow-up from Margaret because of those comments? Not at this particular time. Okay. I may have some questions based on some of the comments mm -hmm. the public made. But well, yeah. I mean, if, uh, no, not at this time. Not from Margaret. Okay. In that case, I will go. We will go to the public comment period, and let me. Um, before I open the public comment, I um, will talk a little bit about our technology and about um, how we'll do this. So if you um, are, are on this call and you, you're signed into Zoom using a computer or a smartphone, if you want to make a comment, please use the raised hands function on your screen and I'll call on you in the order your name appears on the screen. And Leanne, I'll have to ask you to, to call the names because I can't read them from here, okay? You've got a, a computer screen in front of you. Now, if you have called in on phone, um, um, please, not, please use star nine to indicate your desire to speak. And I will call on you by your name or the last four digits of your phone number, whatever information we're getting at that point. You will need to unmute yourself before beginning to speak. And I think, Leanne, will you be able to unmute people? Okay, you will be unmuted when you're called on, excuse me. We would ask when you are called on to state your full name and your address before making your comments. And um, if you don't go first, I would ask you please to try to limit your comments to new information rather than repeating information already covered by previous speakers. And if your concerns already covered, maybe just state that and tell us whether your position is pro-con or neutral on this. There is a chat feature in Zoom, as those of you who know Zoom are familiar with. We're not going to be monitoring that for public comments. We're not going to read what a comment you put in a chat. That just gets a little too complicated for us to go in very multi very in places. But do this. If somehow you can't hear, if there's a technical difficulty, use the chat. So to let us know, and we would appreciate that, unless somebody looking at it for technical problems. We are also going to limit people to speaking once and to speaking for two minutes. We'll be timing comments in order to keep us moving along and to allow everyone who's interested to speak. We will not have screen sharing enabled for the public comment um, period. So if you have a document, we, we're not going to be doing screen sharing. So after everyone has had an opportunity to speak, the supervisors will discuss and consider the proposed ordinance. Again, anything I've missed? Any, any of the staff here or supervisors? Okay, what I will do then is I will open the public comment period. And again, please raise your hand or use star nine on your phone to unmute when you're called on or, and state your name and address and limit comments to two minutes. Do we have anybody who wants to speak? Brian Campbell will be the first one. Okay, Brian Campbell, that if we've got your name correct, would you please state your address and give your comments? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, Brian Campbell, Campbell Engineering and Surveying, 301 Northeast Trilene Drive, Suite 1, Ankeny, 
5021. And um, I just have, a, I went through it and I have some comments on some inconsistencies that I'm worried about and, and a few other comments. But so, first of all, on, on some of the uh, setback requirements, it calls out a foundation from the foundation drain, you know, the, that goes around the perimeter of the house. And it says 10 feet and 10 feet, which is unchanged. But then it's, then you have another uh, setback which says, but from the dwelling, the open part of the system has to be 20 feet. So that's kind of inconsistent. You're saying you got to be 20 feet, feet from the house, but the foundation drain is right around the perimeter of the house. You can be within 10 feet. So they kind of, those don't agree with each other. They're direct conflict the way I, the way I uh, interpret that. So it seems like either the dwelling, the foundation drains, they just need to match up because they're basically the same thing since this foundation drain is the perimeter of the dwelling. Um, another comment in 6518, it talked about um, show um, utility locations. Well, of course, I mean, very difficult. We wouldn't know where utility locations would be other than surface, surface indications such as bowels or manholes. I mean, those could be noted, something like that. But typically, on, well, of course, in a newer development, we have dedicated easements. So if we show the dedicated easements, the easements uh, should be lying within those. And then, of course, um, we're going to have to have, as always, locates done on the property. And so that, that ultimately will dictate and show where those utilities are. So having that requirement as part of the soil evaluation report showing the utilities is I mean, that's very difficult. I mean, we have no idea. And there's a lot of private uh, utilities that aren't even public that, you know, lines, whether they be uh, uh, the private water line or, or a, a drain line, a tile line or something like that. And we would have no idea where those would be located. Oh, I'm sorry. You couldn't hear us because you were talking. Your two minutes is up. I'm going to give you another 30 seconds, if I could. Okay, yes, yeah, sure. And then... Um, and then I want a clarification on 6519. I wish it would write in there say, I know it says later in, regarding subdivisions, right in there should say prior to construction or grading that the, uh, the soil evaluation needs to be uh, done. Because so often I have a problem with uh, they pile dirt or they tear up a, an area that would, could have been used for the septic system, but they destroyed it. So definitely need to get this testing done and uh, protected before any construction or grading commences. Is that sufficient time for you? Um, yeah, I mean, that's the main things. I mean, um, I guess a comment earlier on what you were talking about on those 3,100 permitted systems, I would think you'd want to start with the oldest ones or the ones that weren't been the longest since they've been pumped. Um, that was, I would think that would be the way to go with that. And then on holding tanks, um, I would think it would be good to, require, I don't know, I didn't read it, see it in there, either a light, some kind of notification, a warning, uh, whether it be a light, an alarm, or email of a notification system, when that gets full, that way, um, you know, someone becomes aware that it's full, so that, because it was talking about that issue that they worried about it overfilling. Here's what I'd like to do. Um, we probably want to get, a, a, get some property owners in here, give them an opportunity to speak. I'm going to invite you if you have some more uh, some fairly technical kind of issues yeah. to maybe email um, Margaret James. Yes. Yes. That? Okay. You bet. Okay. I thank you very much for your comments. Do we have somebody else? Yeah. Jen Hogan. Jan. Jen. Jen. Jen Hogan. Jen Hogan. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. My name is Kent Spillers. I'm Jen's husband. We live at 3439 GW Carver Ave. And uh, ab about three years ago, we went to city council and, and uh, when our property was going to be annexed. And so a couple of questions, because we do have a, a septic tank and it was pumped um, five years ago, as, as I think uh, required by law when we bought the house. Um, but, but, but if our tank fails, are we allowed to install a new tank? And technically, we're not in it. Like we're not annex. We're not in the city of Ames. So, so that's one of our concerns. Um, the other one was when we talked about annexation, and we went to City Hall and and, and talked to the to the board of 
do we have to pay to tie into aim sewer? Um, because our entire, you know, front, the, the front bit of our house, if you look on the beacon website, I think we're something like five or 600 feet of, of square footage or of linear footage that there's no sewer out there. And, and our concern is if, if we get annexed and we're told we're now a, a, a property of the city of Ames, I, you're going to cost us out of our home. It's, it's, it's zeros we can't afford. And so I'm just curious what, what we need to do or can do um, living where we do. Thank you. Ned, could you spell your last name? I did not catch your name. I apologize. It is S as in Sam, P as in Peter, I-L-L-E-R-S. Okay. You live at 3439 GW Carver? Correct. Is that the irons? I'm sorry? It's not in the irons, is it? I'm not familiar. No, with we're, we're, we're shy of that. We're just, uh, we're just south of uh, Cedic Point. Okay, thank you. So, so this is Supervisor Olson, and I'd just like to, to uh, explain to you that we don't have anything to do with annexation policy in the city of Ames, okay? So you'll, they most likely would require you at some point to tie into their sewer when they extend it out there, okay? And I get that from a many years covering the, the city as a journalist, all right? So the first part then of your question was, can you just, if your system fails, can you just replace a tank? And Margaret, am I not correct that it, what I read in this ordinance is they would get, instead of a construction permit, they'd get an alteration permit that would allow them to just put in a new tank, correct? If it was just the tank that uh, is shot, then uh, yes, you could get a re an al alteration permit and replace the tank. Um, however, if, if city sewer is available, and the house or the structure is within 200 feet of that, they would be required to hook up unless you can prove extenuating circumstances. And maybe because of your huge frontage um, that would drive up that cost, you could probably get, um, get a waiver and go ahead and continue to be on septic. It's all That's case by case though, so. That would not be the county, that would be the city of Ames if you were annexed. Yeah, you'd ask them for that waiver, but. Does that answer your question, Ken? It, it absolutely does, thank you. And I'm sure at some point we will be annexed. I mean, right now we're not. So, you know, again, it, it's a bit of a ways over to, to Scenic Point and to, to the, the east of us, it's even further to tie into anything. So, you know, for us to foot that cost um, would just be, yeah, I mean, it's it's it wouldn't be affordable, but but at some point, if we if we had to tie in, I I get it. Um, just more concerned because, like I said, it was pumped when we bought it, and now we're coming up on that five year mark. And if they find some some irregularities or or you know something that says that we have to replace it, you know, is that an option for us to replace septic now at that five year mark? So thank you very much. I'd like to if we, Margaret, if we could follow up with Kent, because to explain that at this ordinance as written only requires pumping. There's no requirement of an inspection, correct? Right. So his question about if they find something wrong, that that's a the they would I assume be the company going out, Drain Tech or or whoever, Rotor Rooter. But that's not in our ordinance. That would be between, that would be what he would decide to do as this is written. Right. Um, you know, if it's just the tank, you know, like the baffles that they see went wrong or the wall or something like that, he could replace the tank and continue. If he's not annexed yet, he, that line wouldn't be anywhere close and we wouldn't require him to do anything. Um, but if it's like a time of transfer or a repair, a serious repair that needs to be done, and there is a line within 200 feet, we would require him to hook up um, unless if he's not yet annexed, the city cannot 
the city can require annexation, but he can refuse um, annexation unless they force him. It, it's case by case. It's very complicated. Yeah, it sounds like it's probably more complicated than we can deal with tonight. Let's go on. No, just uh, thank, you very, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. thank you for calling in. Okay, Leanne, do you have somebody else? Okay, Tim, Tim Garten, the city. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, Tim. Uh, hi, hi, Tim. Address uh, 2948 Eisenhower Circle. And this has been a, a very good and helpful presentation. Um, I just have a couple of follow-up questions I can uh, give you and then uh, uh, let you field the questions. Um, the first question um, is, I'd like uh, perhaps Ethan to go a little more into the weeds about the authority under home rule, um, whether you've had any initial feedback from the legislature. Uh, I've served for the last six years on the city council and have found a number of really unpleasant situations where we worked hard on an ordinance and then the legislature came and said, no, you don't have this authority. And so the, there is a tremendous amount of tension right now over the subject of home rule. And so um, my understanding is, is that Story would be the first of the 99 counties to do something like this. And maybe Margaret can correct me if I'm wrong. But um, because you're sort of first to the, to the uh, field here, um, I would be curious to see if there have been some feedback from the legislature um, before getting too far uh, along. Um, and then I guess the second question is if Margaret could review one more time, what would be required for the time of transfers? So you did a nice job of explaining the cycle of pumping, but um, my, uh, I do a lot of work with uh, real estate transfers. And so I just want to make sure I understand when someone wants to sell their acreage and they have a septic system, what will the county be requiring in addition to the groundwater hazard statement uh, today? Thank you for your time tonight. Let's start with Ethan e. Anderson on the home rule question. And then I'd like to comment on that also. Yeah, good, yeah, good evening. Um, so yeah, that's one of the questions that was addressed in one of uh, Margaret's early slides that uh, this is a home rule question. I understand there's been a lot of surprises sometimes from the legislature. Uh, we experienced that with our boards and commissions on the um, Zoning Board of Adjustment and Planning and Zoning Commission, where the legislature was attempting to maybe solve a local issue, but it had a statewide impact. Certainly, that's a, that's a risk here. and I, I sympathize with uh, the city and, and uh, their experience with the state legislature kind of uh, occupying the field, as it's called. But the statutory authority for the uh, county to proceed here is in 455B172 uh, that we can set standards at least as stringent but consistent with standards adopted by the commission. And so that's the statutory authority. In addition, we have the statutory authority in 331, um, 301, 1 through 6. And so as long as our um, ordinance is not inconsistent with state law, we can proceed. And it's not inconsistent with state law unless it's irreconcilable with state law. This isn't a situation where the legislature's occupied the field because they've expressly permitted us under 455B to adopt standards for private sewage disposal facilities that are at least as stringent, but consistent with state law. And then obviously, yeah, the, the potential outcome here would be the legislature reacting to what Story County does. And uh, we may be expressly preempted by a state uh, legislative action. And if that happens, that, that happens. And we just have to uh, cross that bridge when we come to it. But so yeah, I think the county is on a solid legal framework 
to move forward under home rule and uh, 455B to take this uh, legislative action. Supervisor Olson, is, is this the issue you wanted to comment on? This is the issue I wanted to comment on. Okay. We actually, Tim, we re, one of the comments um, uh, that we received also mentioned you're going to, you know, here's another issue that you'll lose the home rule when the state legislators find out what you've done. Basically, I'm paraphrasing the comment. So I know I'm leaving a public office here, okay? Um, but I want to urge you, who is still holding a seat, I want to urge my colleagues to stay strong and not start letting you make decisions based upon fear. Because that is, uh, yes, it's happened. It happened to the city a couple of times where the legislature came in after you worked very hard. And it may happen here. But please don't let fear be the determinant about trying to make the world, our environment, our, you know, us better. So that's just all I wanted to say. And thank you for your efforts too, Tim. Now let's go, Tim, to the question that you had for Margaret and was regarding the, the time of transfer. And I think what I was hearing was what exactly would be required at the time of transfer, is that correct? That's your question. I think you're muted. Um, you want me to yeah. answer? Um, if you oh. recall, his question, Margaret. Yeah. So, one. just what it would be? You know, what would what would be different after January first if? Uh, someone wants to sell their acreage, what, what is the showing that's going to be different if they have a septic system? No difference. No difference because we do not have home rule on the time of transfer. No different. Okay. That's sufficient answer, Tim? Do you yes, have thank you very much. Okay. Do we have anybody else who is uh, asking to speak? Yeah. His name is her name is Rasmussen. Okay, Rasmussen is all it shows here. Could you give Mr. or Ms. Rasmussen, could you give us your first name? Ted Rasmussen, 17377 680th Avenue, Nevada, Iowa, 50201. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick comment, and then um, I had a question for Margaret. Um, it just it's very frustrating with what Supervisor Olson said regarding local control in that um, the county is given a small bit of local control to control the wastewater of three to four people living in a house, but has virtually no control over four to 5,000 animals living in a small confinement unit. Um, the impacts are just so drastically different that I find it very frustrating. Um, the question for Margaret is, uh, on your five years, I know that the recommendation was three for it to work, um, to work best. Um, I guess my question is how do you know what is still, um, functional? You know, it working best is great. Um, it'd probably work best if, you know, you brought up oil changes, if we all changed our oil after a thousand miles, although a lot of them can go to five or 10,000 miles. Um, I just wondered how you guys came about the five years versus maybe seven years versus 10 years um, versus if it's five years for a 500 gallon tank, but 10 years for a thousand gallon tank. So could you just kind of explain that a little bit better to me about um, why the five years? Um. Hi, Ted. So the five years is really just an average that we've found looking through materials, tables, EPA, DNR, uh, engineer studies. Five years, well, most of them say three years. We did five to be a little um, more lenient, okay? Um, the things that affect it is the tank size, the number of people living in the house. If you, if you have a bakery uh, business, if you, um, 
um, homeschool if you you know home a lot more things like that um, garbage disposals uh, all sorts of things and then every once in a while we will get those odd um, situations where we cannot figure it out but they are needing to be pumped every couple of years now when I know that you have a filter in your tank um, so when you check that filter when you see it's getting worse that's when you need to start thinking about pumping um, it's interesting I talked to a lot of people about this in, in developing these regulations and a lot of people use election year as kind of their reminder to pump their tank. So every four years is what they go with. And it's just like um, changing your oil, you know, it's a little darker, maybe not as dark. It's, it, you know, it's just like, well, it's about time, let's do it. Yeah, so it, it's not it's it's not a perfect uh, way to, to, to know. If you wanted to, you could borrow the sludge judge here, and that'll tell you the depth of uh, sludge in the bottom when you're getting within 12 inches of that pipe, time to pump. Okay, thank you. That was all I was wondering was just kind of where the five years came from. Yeah, um, so, and then as far as your comment on animal confinements, I too am very frustrated with that. And I think a lot of people are. Um, this office addresses, um, septic systems, among other things, but septic systems. We um, do not have uh, home rule on anything agriculture, and you know that. So, um, so I focus on what I can focus on. And then also with uh, septic tanks, you have that um, human pathogen that's a bigger problem for public health compared to possibly, uh, you know, hogs or, or cattle. And then um, I guess one last comment the based on reading of the of the um, of the ordinance and then your comments, it really seems to be that this is a kind of a focused problem, but this is our only real lever or opportunity to deal with the focused issues. Is that is this kind of the only way the county can address these kinds of issues? Oh, through new ordinance and then enforcement. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, well, definitely outreach, like Lisa recommended. We we can do better with that. But um, being in this business a good little while, um, you need some something on the books too. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Who has a comment? I'll give it about 30 seconds. Okay, that's about 30 seconds hearing or seeing nobody else. I will close the public comments section and we will go on to discussion and consideration of the proposed ordinance. Supervisors, what is your pleasure? Do you have something, just, would you like to discuss anything prior to making a motion? I do have another question for Margaret, just based on okay. here. Go Margaret, ahead. so I have just another question actually based on um, uh, Ted Rasmussen um, talking about how you came up with the five years. And I know you said um, as average, you look at tank size, number of people, whether there was a disposal, you know, there was a home business, whatever in there. So since you mentioned the number of people, but the ordinance references the number of bedrooms, can you talk to me a little bit about that difference? Because, you know, I know some of these older houses, they may have five, six bedrooms, but two people that live in the hall. So can you mm -hmm. talk about that, that wasn't referenced at all, it just said nothing. Your, your comment to Ted was number of people and you never talked about the number of bedrooms, so. Okay, um, well, soil septic systems are based, sizing is based on soils 
and number of bedrooms, not bathrooms, not people. So you size it for the house. So, if, um, so you know, you might have a, two people living there or you might have 10 people living there. Um, bedrooms, they, they figure two people per bedroom. So these large um, McMansions that are going in, six bedrooms, there's really not going to be 12 people living there, you know, but we still have to follow the regulations. Um, it's those older houses, two, three bedrooms, that's where we get into a little bit of a problem. Um, so it's, with that we do education. One thing that we've done is we've um, changed Beacon so that it shows um, the number of bedrooms that the septic system was sized for. That shows up on Beacon now. Um, as opposed to what Beacon might list it as, uh, as far as number of bedrooms. Um, so those two, if they're way off, that's going to definitely cause some problems, raise a red flag and tell the family who's buying it um, that if I move in with a big family, I might be in for a new septic system because the water change, the water use would change so much. Um, so it's a huge problem that's very hard to tackle because what you call a bedroom, the next person may call a sewing room um, and they'll, they'll argue it. So we try to go with the common sense approach. If you're putting in a three bedroom and five years from now, you're gonna put in um, a, a, another bedroom like in the basement, go ahead and either arrange it so that you can add on and make a four or go ahead and make it a four bedroom. Um, so it, it's a very uh, difficult thing uh, to manage. Um, fortunately, there is wiggle room in the designs of these systems. So if you're a little off, big or little, it's still within that range of acceptability. Thank you. Well, Lisa, if I could throw in a comment that you know, uh, Margaret and Matt can confirm, but um, on Tuesday's board meeting, we looked at possibility of like Shipley and, and, and Iowa Center, okay? And, and we talked about a little bit about the Fernal, Fernal study, et cetera. We had a house in Fernal. This was part of what kind of brought in discussions uh, about, you know, what can be done in Fernal. Margaret, did we not have a house in Fernal that was being rented out and there had been a change of ownership? And the tenants in there, there were like twice the number the septic system was was built for. There's an example, a real world. So even in an unincorporated area, because there were some people living by it, they were suffering also. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really good example. Mm -hmm. well, are there any other questions? Oh, that question is right at the. Okay. Yeah. Um, I I'm I've got something on my mind, so I'll just go ahead and start out the discussion if I could. I've learned a lot through this, and I, I'm somebody who's lived in a house with a septic system probably two thirds of my life, um, and it had one for the past 25 years. But I I learned I learned more than I I did know about it. Um, one observation I have right now is there can be a whole lot of variables in terms of a, an individual septic system and when it needs to, has to, whatever, be pumped out. Um, I'm realizing, I asked, you said you had two and a half full-time staff, two and a half equivalents, and this is only one of the many duties the Environmental Health Department does. I don't think we can, it's reasonable to say we can put together an ordinance that's going to take into account every single little factor and do an individual assessment on every septic system because we don't have the resources and we would have to gear up a lot to have the resources to get that specific on all of these 4,000 septic systems that we have in the county. So I, I'm just gonna say, I, as I said earlier, I don't think you can put all the specifics of a plan, a strategic plan to implement this in an ordinance and I don't expect that. I think we have to give, um, you know, 
your professional judgment and your staff and working with the Board of Health to come up with a, pl a plan that's reasonable and try to be as fair as possible. My bottom line on this is the whole old saying of don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And that's what I think. I think this is progress to come up with a perfect system is way beyond our resources, but we can have a better system. And that's what I'm looking at with this. You know, I look at this too. I mean, I think it's a start of a conversation. Um, I do look at those 900 properties and um, the limited outreach, it sounds like that has been done to those. And if that's where potentially a greater portion of the problem is, I'm not saying there isn't problems with the others, but it sounds like a greater portion maybe with those, then I think that needs to be something that needs to be reached out, educated, whatever, um, mm -hmm. uh, to those particular individuals. Um, I do have, I, I get the, the focus and the reasoning for what's being proposed tonight. Um, for me, I just don't know that I feel comfortable with it because I, um, with where it's at, um, because I think there needs to be some targeting, um, some education first, um, uh, before going into this that is so comprehensive. Mm. Supervisor Olson. So I indicated here up front as I was disciplining because it wasn't stringent enough and it, it wasn't addressing the 900 yet. Okay, but as we sit here and I've been making notes and looking at things, I'm going to reference a phrase that a former person who sat up here said several times is how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Mm -hmm. And this is a bite. Okay, and so even though I am not happy about uh, the fact that it's not stronger, that we're not going after the 900, instead we're kind of using this sidestep approach about you got to get your tank pumped, which is a step, it's a bite, okay, and then hopefully we can use that as an approach to educate them and urge them or whatever to they've got to stop polluting or they're going to end up doing a, doing a violation, all right, rather than just going straight after is, hey, you got violations here now, you're polluting now, and you need to bring it up to date. So, um, so even though it is not perfect, all right, I'm probably ending up more with Supervisor Merkin here about don't let the uh, imperfect be the enemy of the good. And it's a first step, and if the Board of Health, this is, this is where they felt also being comfortable. They do have a member of the Board of Health who this is his profession, plumbing. I mean, you know, he is a plumbing contractor, et cetera. And one of the reasons we like to put different people on our boards is to provide different perspectives. So I can imagine just some of what he said, okay, on that. So um, so it's a it's a it's that first bite, it's that first step. And, and I understand I understand that, I respect that. I just again I look at like the question I brought about the shared septic system. Mm -hmm. um, well if this goes into place, when does when does that have to be separated out? Is that an immediate, is it immediate, there's no time frame as to when does that need to be taken care of? Um, uh, do all these septic systems have to, you know, come January 1, be calling to get those pumped out? What's the time frame to be able to do that? That's, you know, it's, it's not um, uh, put in there. So that, yeah, I feel like it's lacking some of that particular clarity um, in there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I am all for water quality, Ab absolutely for that. Um, how do we know by saying uh, the random five years, because you could have a house that, yes, and I understand you go by bedrooms and the, the formula that it goes through, I may have two people in there, so it may not, I may not need, it. Mm -hmm. I, I could maybe go beyond five years. I, I understand that average in there. How are we kind of connecting that we've got to improve water quality um, to this. I mean, I, I get the impetus and I think, you know, by pumping it more, we're clearing out and getting out some of the, the sludge and everything else. Um, 
but where are we kind of doing that final testing because you do have other environmental factors that kind of play in? Well, the reality is that we are doing some water testing for, for pollution problems in Story County. Um, we're working on that through our um, through various groups in the county right now. Conservation is taking a lead on that. Our water quality work group has taken a lead on that. Troy Rivers of Iowa, the city of Ames, I think there's other cities that have become involved. But that's another thing that isn't really a well-funded thing and we're kind of cobbling monies together to do that and we're using a lot of volunteers to do that. Um, I think that we can pull that water testing that we're doing into this. But then again, but again, I think it's not something that we can get in an ordinance. It's something we get in a plan because, because we're taking the steps. We're, we're taking the steps, but we don't have it there. We can't, we can't say, yeah, we've got this huge database of all this water quality. We can compare all of these things, you know, to what, what was. Um, I, one thing I've just discovered in the last year is how complex an issue water testing is, water monitoring is. So I know we're making progress. There's people who know a heck of a lot more than I do, and Margaret Jane's is one of them, and there's some other ones in this in this county who do. So I think that's probably another goal is to say now, you know, as we, you know, how we how we fold this together. But I don't think we do that in an ordinance. I I I I think that the best thing that I can see is that. Margaret and her staff put together a plan, run it by the Board of Health because they report to the Board of Health. You know, we might ask her to share that with the Board of Supervisors as well to give some feedback on the fairness issue, you know, on the issue of, of are we really focusing in on the right people. I think we can work on the implementation together and come up with a good system. Yes. But along these lines too, I thought I, I did what I was thinking about this in the 900 who, you know, going after. And I just do the math. If let's say that it just cost an average of $250 for each one of those um, properties estimated at 900 for us to go out and do education, advocacy, start sending that string of letters about. You're talking about $225,000. Okay. That, yeah, <laughs> I just saw Margaret go eat. Um, but, you know, so, but when talking about, she's worried about, you know, the budget to send out letters to everybody, which I'm sure the next board would help with, I hope. Okay. But, you know, when you start looking at it from that, that's one of the reasons also that I'm in favor of it's a bike. Okay, mm -hmm. is that that it's really going to take cooperation between the Board of Health and the Board of Supervisors mm -hmm. and some of the citizens. And then the other thing I think about about when you say the five year average, okay, it's like we have to renew our driver's licenses every so often. And now that I'm getting to the age, yeah, we just go, oh my. Okay, <laughs> First day, I okay that. that's right. But but the point is, you know, is that the assumption is, is that you're still a good driver for those what five or ten years, whatever it is. Although I'm you know, my eyesight isn't what it used to be. I'm a little scared next time I have to go in. It's an average, right? You just can't set up an individual time frame for everybody. Sure. That'll be way more than two or three. Sure. Yeah, I, I understand that. Um, but I also look at too that you could go in, assess the system, pump the system, and find out there is a problem with it. But they don't have to fix it. They could just say, well, I'll just leave it. I'll just leave it. There's no requirement to them to fix it. I'd be open to a change there that would be going back to the process, back to the Board of Health, republishing or whatever. I mean, you know, uh, I, I'm just trying to figure you, out, are we getting are we getting to the problem when we're saying we'll pump it, but you don't have to fix it? I have a feeling that Margaret had a reason to write it that way, so let me ask. Yeah. Yeah. And it's because the pumpers don't want to be put in between a rock and a hard place. They uh they they have to have the trust of their customers. The customers have to trust their pumpers um, to not rat on them. 
And this has just been an age old problem. You know, some of the really bad ones, uh, systems, they get called in, but for the most part, they'll fix what they can and go away. Um, because otherwise word gets out that he'll ratch out and, and he'll not have a job anymore. You know, it, it's a very tricky business to be in. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Are we, I just have a processing question. So looking at, the proposed ordinance and then the actual ordinance here that's before us. So what is the process if it would go through tonight, if, what are the next steps? There would be a second consideration which has been proposed for November 24th. And so we would probably do that at our regular meeting on the 24th. We could waive third consideration or we could, we could schedule third consideration for December 1st. Is that correct? Margaret, as far as you know, and I don't know if Ethan's still on. Ethan had another meeting. Oh, he had an eight o'clock meeting. That's what, we've, that's what we have, I know. That's what we have before us in the resolution. So, right, okay. second and third hearing. Unless if there's, um, if there's major changes, then we will have to republish and then have another first hearing. And, is the and, way Ethan explained it to me. Yeah. And people can argue what's major and what isn't major, so it's safest, you know, unless it's that that the was misspelled or something like that, it's safest to have a republishing. So, so. Yeah. so my question then goes with, if this document says it would begin January 1, 2021, but the ordinance itself says it would be effective upon final passage and after publication. So does that mean it could be effective in December 2020? Or is it January 2021? Um, I think that because the ordinance itself says 2021, January 1, 2021, when our resolution just makes it, yes, it's effective upon, isn't it, Shelly, upon publication. However, the ordinance itself gives a date. So that means that still it wouldn't kick until January 1, 2021. It's not like the mask one where it didn't give us the date effective. Well, this, this says this ordinance yeah. shall be effective after its final passage, approval, and publication of the ordinance or summary thereof. Yes. Okay. But the publication well, we of, of the ordinance or the summary of the ordinance. And right. the summary right. of the ordinance will include the date it takes effect. Yes. Okay. 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 See, so that would be, so it's the mass ordinance never set a date to take effect, which is why it kicked on publication. Okay. This is still, yes, it's effective on publication, but the ordinance itself says when it takes effect. Okay. okay. Just wanted that clarification okay. there. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. If not, I would entertain a motion regarding uh, proposed ordinance number 287. I would move that we approve uh, for, for, on first reading and set the second reading for Tuesday, November 24th. At 10 a.m. Thank you. Um, I can second if you don't want to. No, I'm not. Okay, I'll second the motion. Is there further discussion? I, it's okay. No, yeah, no, I'm just gonna say my, my issue is, is I, I think we really need to be targeting those 900. Um, I don't think we're doing enough in that particular area. If they're the ones that, if that's where the greater um, issue is, I get it taking the uh, initial bite out of it. Um, I just don't know that you're really result, resolving an issue when we're not targeting that group at all. And you not have to be pumped, but we're not really um, educating them any further mm -hmm. on there. That's, yeah. that's the issue that I have. And maybe that's something we can work on in budget hearings or with the Board of Health and Environmental Health. I think that it does re it require everybody gets pumped in five years, and that's a lot more than we are doing now. And um, 
maybe we could figure out, you know, one of the things you can do with getting information out is getting, I understand, and I don't know a lot about it, but there's, there's funding available for replacing tanks, you know, maybe that's from DNR, is that correct, Margaret? You're muted, Margaret. Margaret, you're muted. Um, sorry. Um, USDA Rural Development has some money. There's a little bit of local money, but that gets you grabbed pretty fast. And then there's a state um, revolving fund, within, but it's a low interest loan. It's not a grant. So there's a little bit of money, but um, kind of hard to get your hands on. The, the interest rates are so low that the revolving fund doesn't really help that much right now. That'd be true. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Olson? Aye. Edmonds? No. Merck and I. Okay. So the ordinance has been passed on first consideration. Second consideration set for November 24th. So I do have another process question here and uh, we'll have to address it with Ethan. But so Mr. Campbell, uh, for example, the engineer who had some suggestions about some changes in wording, all right. Uh, and we did hear from a Mr. Carroll, I, if I got it right. He had marked up uh, what appeared like he had technical knowledge too. So the question to go back to Ethan is if those changes would trigger needing us to go back through the process again. Okay, and, and, and I guess I would leave it up to Margaret to say whether she would look at those and yeah. say, oh, there's, there's something that just can't wait. I mean, I don't think this is the last time we're gonna look at this ordinance. I don't think so. You know, it could be that you could look at it and say, maybe it's something you can implement without a revision to the proposed ordinance, or maybe it's something that could wait. Um, but I think I think Margaret would need to see all that information and look at that to make that determination and that recommendation to us. I agree. Anything and, else? Um, actually, I I already addressed Mr. Um, Carroll's uh, comments because they came in in the March batch, but I thought they were important enough to include in the comments. <clears throat> But um, Mr. Campbell's, I, I, will, I would like to take a look at them because he has some good ideas there, I think. Okay. Well, I want to thank you, Margaret. I want to thank the Board of Health. I want to thank all your staff, and I want to thank all the staff who helped us um, with the meeting tonight. And I know some long hours for people. And um, as I said, I think this is, it's, we won't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This is good moving forward in my mind. So if there's nothing else, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. So move, second. Edmonds? Aye. Aye. Merkin, aye. We're adjourned. Thank you very much.